Hi, welcome to lesson two. What we're going to be doing today is some analysis of the characters. And our learning question for today, for today is, can I make detailed notes and collect apt quotations to learn? Well, I actually will hope that you can because I've done most of the work for you. Um, the second part of the learning question is, can I use quotations to write an analytical essay about a specific character. So what I am going to do for you is I'm going to take one of the characters after we've been through all the quotations and I'm going to use those quotations and turn it into an analytical essay and then I would like you to have a go at writing another analytical essay on a similar but different character. So that's what we're aiming towards. So you can see that it's not just about collecting quotations, it's also about how to use the quotations. So um, before we get started, it would be a really, really good idea to pause this video and reread through about the first 10 pages of the play. So uh, read through the opening of Inspectacles, remind yourself of the big stage directions at the beginning and uh, read through the dialogue until you get up to where the parlour maid Edna brings in the inspector and then you can stop reading there and that will um, be enough for you to do the analysis of the characters. Okay, so um, what we're going to be doing is making some character notes, as I said, and um, in, below in the description is a worksheet that you can use to help you and do the characters it just says the name of each character and it has a still from the film that I had you watch last time um, so you can use those if you have access to a printer or if you want to keep everything online that would be a really good thing to do if you just want to do it in your book you could um, cut out the characters and glue them into your book or you could just write Mr Burling in the middle or you could draw a little stick Mr Burling like I did with the table set up last time kind of using um, some of these quotations to help you think about what he might look like so um, we're going to start off with Arthur Burling and that's your subheading and um, here, are, here are some of the quotations to describe him. What you want to do is write down the quotation, but also leave a little bit of room as well so you can write down some of the analysis. I'm not trying to squeeze them all onto this page. Here's the quotations. You need to listen to what I say and think about how you can analyse each of these quotations. Right, the first quote is he's in his middle 50s and there's not much to analyse there but you know he's typical age for a dad with kids who are in their 20s and the fact that in, he's in his middle 50s it shows that he's made his way in life. Um, he's got to middle age. He's a few years, certainly a few more years before he is going to think about retiring. But um, someone who's in their mid 50s, they're unlikely to start changing their point of view. Um, and you'll see that as the play goes on. He's not someone who wants to back down from the attitudes and the values that he's cultivated throughout his life. Um, and some of those attitudes and values you can see in what he says. So he describes himself as a hard-headed, practical businessman. And he repeats very, very slight variations of this quotation throughout the um, opening few pages. So there he's talking about him and, and kind of people like him, hard-headed, practical businessmen. Um, in other places, he talks more specifically about himself. And he's really, really proud of that. Hard-headed means that he's unemotional, um, that like if bad things happen, he doesn't let them upset, upset him um, or disturb him emotionally. It means that he can make hard, tough decisions with, with his head without getting his heart, his emotions involved in those decisions. So it's kind of like the person who will hire and fire really easily. He um, wants to, um, he sees his business um, and his daughter's engagement as a merger of two companies, Crofts Limited and Burling and & Company. And um, 
quite often actually in that speech that he gives to Sheila and Gerald, he seems more excited about the prospect of the marriage bringing the two companies together than he does about these two young people who are going to be happy, who, who are in love with each other. And the quotation that kind of supports that is what um, Crofts and Burlings will be working together for lower costs and higher prices. So it means that um, if they kind of almost make a merger instead of being in competition with each other, they can push down the running costs and they can charge their consumers. So like you and I who want to buy their fabrics, for example, they can charge us higher prices because they kind of dominate the market. Now, don't forget that the running costs of a business, most of the running costs are the staff that they have work in there. So if the two companies keep wages, if they both agree to keep wages really, really low, then no one will leave Mr. Burling's company to go and work for Croft so then get paid more. Um, and that means they can force the wages down. So you can see that he's being a hard-headed practical businessman. It's all about the profit and not about keeping a loyal staff in Burling's company. So um, just to kind of like round up this attitude, um, we have a stage direction, Burling lights his cigar. And although we said earlier the cigar is a symbol of celebration, um, it's traditionally like when someone has a baby, for example, the men will smoke a cigar for some bizarre reason to, to welcome the baby quite an old tradition. Um, a cigar is also a sign of a kind of a greedy capitalist. So like a businessman who loves his money. We will talk more about what capitalist means and what capitalism means in future lessons. But this idea of a, a wealthy man in a bow tie smoking a big fat cigar is a sign of kind of a businessman enjoying um, the wealth that his business has created. Um, interestingly, this um, cigar in 1945, when the play was written, was also really, really associated with the wartime leader, Winston Churchill as well. Um, and again, when we come to talk about the politics of this play, and conservatism and capitalism, like I said, will come back to this idea of Winston Churchill and his cigar. We often look back on Winston Churchill as a fantastic politician who got us through World War II, where we beat, when the Allies beat um, the um, axis of evil um, in Japan, Italy and Germany. Um, but coming out of the war, people considered that Churchill wasn't a good peacetime ruler. Um, so people weren't so keen on him. Um, so some of that political bias and thinking of Winston Churchill as a great um, British man, uh, you may have to push to one side for this play and look at some of his politics, which weren't so pleasant. So um, that's uh, that's Mr. Burling as, as a businessman, as a middle-aged man and the kind of values that he espouses. Um, I guess the fact that he's heavy looking goes with this good living that he's enjoying, enjoying his money. You can see the character here maybe doesn't look exactly like you might imagine Mr. Berlin. You might ima imagine Mr. Berlin to be a bit of a bigger lad, um, someone who, who enjoys his port and, and his whiskey and his wine and his cigars a little bit more. And um, the other thing that I noticed about this character is he doesn't quite do this stage direction. So it says Mr. Berlin is rather provincial in his speech. He kind of does, but he kind of doesn't. This actor, um, has a slight, what I call a South London accent. Um, so you can tell that he comes from South London. He's got a little um, touch of that London accent about him, which is not quite provincial, um, but it, it's showing that he's basically, he doesn't have a posh 
accent. In the BBC version of An Inspector Calls from a couple of years ago, the actor playing Arthur Burling had a Scottish accent. Um, and um, However, I always imagine a provincial, provincial in his speech means that he has maybe a North Midlands accent or even a Northern accent, maybe a Yorkshire or a Lancashire accent, that kind of up North kind of accent. That's what I imagine here. Basically, what this is indicating to the audience, though, is he doesn't have that class and breeding. The way that he talks rather provincial in his speech shows that he is a man who's not from the southeast. He's not from London. He hasn't been to a posh private school. He is a self-made man. He has made new money and his accent marks that out immediately and that's why it's really important that he doesn't speak in what we call standard English or received pronunciation, the kind of accent that Prince William uses and that the Queen uses, that's called received pronunciation and Arthur Burling doesn't talk like that, he's provincial in his speech. We also see and the playwright J.B. Priestley using a lot of dramatic irony when he creates the character of Arthur Burling. Here's a couple of examples of dramatic irony. He says, two years before the First World War, the Germans don't want war. And the audience would know that there wasn't just one war, but two wars. Um, in between the first time they saw this play and when the play was set. So it doesn't make Arthur Burling just wrong once, it makes him wrong twice because not only did the Germans want war for the First World War, they also wanted war for the Second World War too. And this use of dramatic irony shows that the audience should suspect and not trust anything that Arthur Burling says. More dramatic irony is when he describes the ship, the Titanic, that we discussed last lesson. He refers to it as unsinkable, absolutely unsinkable. And this compounds our understanding that we shouldn't believe what Mr. Burling says, because he's got it, he's got this one wrong, doubly. The Germans don't want war. Well, we've had war with them twice since he said that. And the fact that he thinks the Titanic is unsinkable, absolutely unsinkable, is one of the most famous historical disasters um, in, in the history of the 20th century, really. OK, so that's what we learn straight away. Don't trust what this man says. So perhaps the kind of things we shouldn't trust are we should pay our staff less so that we can make more profit in our business. Maybe we shouldn't be trusting that. Maybe we shouldn't think that being a hard-headed practical businessman is a good thing. Maybe a good businessman will show some emotion, perhaps. Um, so if we can't trust this, then why should we trust this? That's what J.B. Priestley is trying to convey there. Um, however, although he is rather provincial in his speech, um, this shows that he's not trying to be fake in a way. He's not trying to cover up his roots. He is proud that he's worked his way up. And you can tell that he's proud because he has easy manners. He is a man who is comfortable in his own skin. Having said that, as I pointed out last lesson, he is desperate to climb that social ladder. And he tells Gerald that he might become Sir Arthur or Sir Burling. He says it's just a knighthood. He recognises that it's not that much of a big deal, but it's a small step to achieving that social status and that class that he desperately desires. So whilst he is a man who seems comfortable in his speech and who has easy manners, he, he's the kind of guy who gets on with everyone and seems comfortable in his skin, he is desperate to climb the social ladder and pay, perhaps so that he can get respect of people like Gerald's parents and he can move in those upper class circles. That's something that he really, really wants. So that's 
Arthur. If you need to watch that again and pause it a bit more and make some analytical notes, now would be a good time to do that. Okay, so we're moving on to his lovely wife, Sybil. Sybil Burling, or Mrs. B, as she's normally referred to in the stage directions. And let's start over here. So, um, whereas uh, Mr. Burling was in his 50s, she's possibly a little bit younger, she's about 50. So again, a middle-aged woman, similar age, maybe slightly younger than her husband. And again, this is conveying that um, she's got to that stage in life where she's unlikely to start changing her attitudes and opinions and the values that she holds dear to her. Um, J.B. Priestley tells us in the stage direction she's a rather cold woman and he's talking about her emotions there and this stage direction is really really for the actress who's going to be playing Mrs. Burling. Um, she needs to be well em emotionally cold she seems to come across as quite quite a frosty character um so she wouldn't necessarily use warm body language towards her children um or warm body language even towards her husband she criticizes um arthur burling um even in front of gerald um and certainly has no worries about criticizing him in front of her own children too um we find out um, something that we discussed when we talked about class last time, that she is her husband's social superior. Um, so the kind of ways that we might be able to tell that uh, by the accent that the actress playing Mrs. Burning would use, by the way that she kind of carries herself. Um, for example, we can tell that he is this kind of self-made man who's worked his way up and has become wealthy, whereas she kind of has that class and breeding. And perhaps also that's why she's rather a cold woman too. So um, what else do we find out about Mrs. Burling? Now, depending on your attitude towards alcohol, um, this might make you judge her a little bit too. Um, when they are getting ready to make the toast with the port, um, Arthur notices his wife has not taken any, and I put square brackets around port because that's not in the text, so to show that I've added that in. So she hasn't had any port. Now in 1912, um, in that Edwardian era, the Edwardian era was quite a raucous um, era, and the upper classes um, were kind of known to have quite drunken parties sometimes, especially Edward VII himself. He was described as a party prince um, and he had to be a bit more sensible when he became king, but not much. Um, and a lot of the upper classes would kind of gamble, which is why they were losing their money as well, because they would kind of go gambling. Um, there was at the time something called the temperance movement, which many women signed up to, and they um, would encourage others not to drink um, and many people of the time thought that this uh, they were being quite spoiled sports about it so Sybil Burling um, it, it kind of almost suggests perhaps she was a member of this temperance movement the people who didn't want to encourage drinking um, she does have just a little glass of port to toast Gerald and Sheila under duress. She doesn't really want to. So again, um, you could say that um, the fact that she doesn't drink shows that she always wants to stay in control. She doesn't want to become emotional. She wants to stay this kind of cold, controlling woman. Um, whereas if she did have alcohol, perhaps it would make her like lo lose control a little bit. Um, she seems very comfortable ordering Edna, the parlour maid, around. She says, I'll ring from the drawing room when we want coffee to Edna. So she's very comfortable um, being in charge of a servant and having a servant running errands for her. Um, so it's kind of like um, poor old Edna um, has finished serving the dinner. She's cleared away the plates, but she's still got to be on call waiting for these um, privileged people um, to decide when, when they want their coffee. They can't even make themselves coffee at the end of the night. She has to be on call for them. And then um, 
when Mr. Burling praises the cook um, and says, oh, tell cook from me, it was a delicious meal, something like that. She turns to him and says, Arthur, you're not supposed to say such things. So um, she kind of comes from this class of people, the kind of the lower upper classes, if you like. So it's upper class attitude that servants should be absolutely ignored and invisible. They just do what they do and you don't even notice them. Of course, you shouldn't praise the cook. Whereas Arthur Burling wants to praise the cook and show appreciation for her hard work, because in a way, that's the kind of background he's come from. He, he's worked his way up. So maybe someone like his mother or even his grandmother might have been in domestic service. And when, um, when Sybil um, puts him down like that in front of Gerald. He doesn't doesn't really care. He says we're treating Gerald like one of the family now. But she she properly puts him in his place. You're not meant to praise the cook. You act as if the servants, the staff are invisible. So really, I we're not getting a very nice opinion of Mrs. Burling at all. Definitely, J. B. Priestley does not want to present her as an attractive character, someone that we warm to, not at all. Um, and then when Sheila refers to her brother Eric as squiffy or drunk, she, she says, what an expression, Sheila, the things you girls pick up, what an expression, Sheila. So here it's kind of like she expects a different kind of behaviour from women than from men. Women certainly shouldn't use um, casual slang language which is verging on almost almost swearing and saying you're squiffy um and then finally possibly the most disturbing quotation um when we think about her her marriage and what women should expect of marriage in the Edwardian era this is a really really long quote i wouldn't expect you to learn this quotation off by heart the bit that i've underlined is the bit that you probably want to learn off by heart. She says, um, to she, Sheila says, where were you, Gerald, all last summer? Why did you stay away with me so much? Mrs. Burling says, men with important work to do sometimes have to spend nearly all their time and energy on their business. You'll have to get used to that, just as I had. So it's this idea that as, as a woman, as a wife of a businessman in Edwardian England, you have to put up with being ignored by your husband. You have to put up with your husband putting work before family. Um, and instead of sympathising with Sheila about that, she tells Sheila, you'll have to get used to that. So that's the quotation you want to remember. You'll have to get used to that. OK, um, the last quotation that I've got here is um, Gerald produces the, the wedding, um, the engagement ring. And she says, that was clever of you, Gerald. And you'll notice that both Mr. Burling and Mrs. Burling are always full of compliments for Gerald um, and don't have many compliments for their own offspring. OK, so um, here's, here's Sheila. Um, and at the beginning of the play, it says that Sheila is very pleased with life. Well, if we're going to analyse this, she would be very pleased with life. Um, a girl like Sheila would have been brought up to snag herself a wealthy husband. That would be her sole purpose in life, basically. Um, she coming from the family she comes from she wouldn't be expected to work for a living that would be scandalous if someone like Sheila had to work for a living so her sole purpose is to snag herself a husband and she's not only managed to get herself a wealthy husband but also a husband who is going to inherit his father's title Lord Croft so no wonder Sheila is looking very pleased with life and certainly from early on in the play um, it seems that Gerald and Sheila have a genuine um, attraction and affection and love between each other. So it's not just a marriage of convenience, um, certainly not in the way that it's portrayed in this production. If you watch the BBC production, you might disagree on, on that, but um, definitely she has every reason as well to be rather excited. Her future is looking really, really good right now. And, and 
she's got the ring on it, hasn't she? So, um, so you know, it's kind of all done and dusted and illegal. Um, she we should also be pleased with life because she is a pretty girl. Um, and again, for a girl like Sheila, in order to be able to snag yourself a husband, um, being pretty was really important. Um, so again, in the BBC production, um, you might not think she's pretty. So obviously that was a decision that was made, but I do think that she should be played as a pretty girl. I think it's important. Um, she's in her early 20s. So again, that gives a little bit of flexibility to the director of the play who's casting. Um, and then we get this idea um, when she talks to Gerald. It says she's half serious and half playful when she talks to him. Um, she uses mock aggressiveness. So she's been quite cross and aggressive to him, but you can tell that she's being fake. And then she talks to Gerald gaily. Um, which obviously that word's kind of changed its meaning these days, but she talks to him really happily, but possessively. And that's not a very happy um, kind of thing to do in a relationship of equals, is it, to be possessive? So it's kind of like when she looks at Gerald, she's half and half. She kind of, half of her is being kind of playful and playing around and being happy. But the other half seems to show that there is, um, there are maybe some cracks under the surface. So she is pretending to be a little bit aggressive or bossy to him. She's a bit possessive. So perhaps that shows that she's worried that she's not quite, quite got him all to herself. And here she is half serious when she talks to him. Um, this could show about the relationship between Gerald and Sheila, but it could also show what she's like as a character as well. Like half of her is um, quite immature and playful. Um, it's like kind of this relationship, it's all a game and her life is just a game. But on the other on the other hand, she does have a much more serious side to her. She can be aggressive and stand up for what she believes in. If something's serious, she can take it seriously. Um, and if she feels possessive about a person, um, it, it could mean that she wants to protect them. She wants to do something about it. Um, so with Sheila, we get two sides to her personality, which we do not see with Mr. and Mrs. Berlin. Remember, they're in their mid 50s. So their personalities are, are kind of fixed. Whereas someone like Sheila, she could turn into this um Kind of quite determined aggressive like serious kind of person or she could stay as the playful gay person that she's presented just looking on the bright side all the time so um i just said she's quite childish at the beginning and you have a look at some of this language rather excited you might expect that more at a children's party than an engagement party at the beginning of the play not the way they act it they changed it she called her mama but in the script she calls her parents mummy and daddy um, which is a very childish way to refer to your parents, mummy and daddy. Um, you might think she'd call them mum and dad or mother and father. See how that changes as the play moves on, how she addresses her parents. Um, and then when she is given her engagement ring, she gets really excited about it. And she's like, look, mummy, look, mummy, isn't it a beauty? And again, this sounds quite childish, almost like she's opening up her favorite Christmas present, that kind of thing. And then finally, um, quite tellingly, Eric warns Gerald in a bit of sibling banter, really. She's got a nasty temper sometimes. And um, as the play goes on, bear this quotation in mind because J.B. Preecy is using the technique of foreshadowing here. He's giving us a clue in the script to something that's going to happen later in the play. So let's uh, keep an eye out for Sheila's nasty temper and how it causes trouble for the Burling family. Okay, so that's your Sheila. Okay, next one, next character is Eric. And I'll be quite honest with you, straight from the word go, Eric is my favorite character in the play. I think he's um, like the most rounded character. He's, he's 
quite intense. Um, he he does some interesting things during the play. So um, Eric's in his early 20s. Um, but when you see the way that the other characters talk to him and the way they treat him, I would say that out of him and Sheila, he is the younger of the siblings. So although both of them are in their early 20s, he definitely, through the dialogue, through the language, he comes across as the younger of, of the two siblings. Um, he is seated downstage, remember, we discussed that last time. So he's sitting nearest to the audience, but he's the only one who doesn't have that barrier of the table between him and the audience. Um, being seated downstage stage does kind of isolate him somewhat from the other family members. Um, and that table, again, kind of cuts him off from the other family members too. So he definitely is presented as an outsider in the family. Perhaps he doesn't share um, the same kind of views and attitudes, beliefs as the rest of the family. And even in the small section that you've seen, you can see there's really big kind of disagreements between him and his father. And this only gets worse as the play goes on. Um, he's kind of like Sheila in the way that he's presented. So if we have a look, he's described as not quite at ease. So Gerald Croft um, is described um, as kind of quite a comfortable, the easy man about town. And Mr. Burling is described as having an easy manner. So those two men are really comfortable in themselves, but Eric is not quite at ease. So you want to think, why isn't he quite at ease? Is it because he doesn't feel like he fits in with his family, he feels isolated from his family, like his downstage? Um, is it because he's got something on his mind that is bothering him? Um, but, but you'll see, he doesn't seem as comfortable as the other two male characters. Um, he's described as half shy, half assertive. So this is really, really similar to the way that Sheila was described, the, what we just went through. So he's like a half and half character. So who's he going to be when he gets to 50 years old, like Mr. Burling? Is he going to be the shy character who's always living in the shadow of his very assertive, rather silly sister? Or is he going to assert himself? Um, is he going to become more confident? Is he going to actually get his points across? Is he going to learn to be that person? Um, well, maybe he is, because even in this short section, one of the stage directions tells us that Eric speaks to Mr. Burling defiantly. So Mr. Burling and Gerald are joking about the Burling family not getting into any trouble so that Mr. Burling can become Sir Arthur and get his knighthood. And um, they seem to be sharing, I guess, what we call like an in-joke. And Eric doesn't like this at all. And he says, I don't find it very funny. And he says that defiantly. So he does have his moments where he speaks up for himself. And um, however, he has moments when he really, really doesn't speak up for himself. There is a lot of sibling banter between Eric and Sheila. At one point, Sheila um, criticises him, don't be an ass, Eric. And the actor playing Sheila, she says, don't be an ass, Eric. But actually, it's quite ambiguous. It could be an ass, as in don't be donkey-like, Eric, kind of slow and stupid. But obviously, that's the way that Americans spell ass. So you, I think that Mrs. Burling would have had something to say if Sheila had said, don't be an ass, Eric. But you interpret that the way that you like. Um, and Sheila accuses Eric of, of being drunk, you're squiffy, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. And then Eric is really concerned about war. So in 1912, he's heard or read probably in newspapers that there's going to be a war. What about war? Um, but instead of letting Eric get his point across, Mr. Burling just interrupt him, cuts him straight down, just let me finish Eric. So it's like when Eric has a mature, thoughtful point to make, something that he's concerned about, he wants to make his point, Mr. Berlin just cuts him down flat. So you can see why the boy is shy, because 
you can see that this probably goes on all the time. They're sitting around having dinner. Eric tries to make a point and Mr. Berling cuts him down and no one really takes him seriously in the family. But let's go back to this point because we can get a really good A03 social historical point about this. So Eric is in his early 20s in 19. 12. Interestingly, the playwright um, J.B. Priestley in 1912 would have been 17, nearly 18 years old. So Eric is a character who is closest to the playwright's age when the play is set. Um, and probably J.B. Priestley back in 1912 was really worried about war too, because World War I was indeed just around the corner and that started in 1914 and eric because he we find out later because he went to university and because he went to um a, a private school probably a public school it, it never tells us which public school he went to but if you think about somewhere like eton one of those kind of schools he went somewhere like that um, and because his father is wealthy and because he's moving in these um a kind of upper middle class like lower upper class circles he's moving with these people when war comes eric is officer class officer class so this silly boy who sheila calls an ass who is shy who can't even get a statement out he's going to be leading troops in world war one he's going to be an officer with um men that he's going to be leading into battle um that's a frightening thought but it might go some way to helping us understand the last point that we want to make and that is sheila says you're squiffy um and she says that because eric suddenly guffaws a guffaw is kind of like a snorty kind of laugh it's like when you kind of go to laugh but then you try and stop yourself laughing and the laugh ends up kind of coming out of your nose instead of being a proper laugh so eric suddenly guffaws because gerald says something which piques his interest so he suddenly like almost laughs out loud and like laughs through his nose at something that gerald says and sheila accuses him of being drunk you're squiffy and then a little bit later um in those first 10 pages in the first 10 minutes of the play um eric comes back from a conversation with his mother off off stage he takes the decanter remember that's the um, jar with the port in it and helps himself um so he comes from talking to his mother and pours himself another glass of port um and drinks that down and um i find it interesting that a young man has managed to get himself um drunk like noticeably drunk um in a really really small family celebration of after a meal um and if i was kind of quite a, mem a member of the audience who was kind of giving a bit of thought to that i might wonder why um and it might support loads of these points the fact that he's always been told to be quiet by his father, but he's being um, put down by his sister and called rude names. Um, the fact that he is shy, maybe he's drinking that drink to give himself a little bit more easiness, um, a bit more confidence. Maybe that's why he's drinking. Um, maybe to give him the confidence to speak up to Mr. Burling, um, to start to defy him. Um, and maybe that's why he's having a drink so that he'll stand up for himself a little bit more. Um, however, here's an interesting quote from that beginning bit. Mr. Burling and Gerald are talking about the wedding and talking about Sheila and about how girls love new clothes and things like that. And Eric wants to join the conversation. Eric says eagerly, yes, I remember. And then the stage direction says, but he checks himself. So it's like, they're talking about girls and they're talking about girls like in clothes. And he thinks of something that reminds him of girls liking clothes. And he wants to join in that kind of like manly conversation about what women love. And just as he's about to say something, he stops. So 
I don't want to give any spoilers here, but I do want you to think about this, what's going on perhaps in Eric's private life that might make him drink a bit too much, get drunk in front of the family. Or is he drinking too much because he's worried about going to war? Or is he worried about just this whole family dynamic? Why is Eric drinking too much? Hold that in your heads and think about analysing that. Okay, finally, um, we've got Gerald. Um, I always find like, Gerald quite a problematic character. And as we go on in the play, you'll see why. Um, so how is he described? He's described as an attractive chap. Um, he's described as rather too manly to be a dandy. Um, so... Uh, what a dandy was in Edwardian times um, was a kind of man who dressed almost um, quite effeminately, so in quite a feminine um, fashion. So maybe wearing um, like a, a velvet jacket, maybe wearing like a lacy shirt. Um, it was almost um, like the kind of um, fashion that a highwayman would have worn like 200 years previously. Um, the dandies would tend to grow their hair out a little bit longer um and like i said have quite almost quite a feminine look about them and that was really really fashionable in edwardian times for single men um but he's kind of too manly to to carry that look off i think that's that's what they're saying there so you kind of need a man's man um he is uh, about 30 so you can see in our production the actor playing Gerald. He's probably about 10 years too young, actually, if, if this was professional um, and on the stage, you'd need to cast someone a little bit older than this. You can see that he's too similar in age to um, Eric and Sheila. He looks like he's in his early 20s and he probably is because it was a university project, this film. So the real Gerald should be about 30. And what's significant about that age is he's kind of like bridging the two generations isn't he um sheila is probably eight or nine years younger than him and then mr burling is about 20 years older than him so um gerald kind of sits in between those two generations the other point about him being about 30 is he has got some experience of life he's described as a man about town so that means um that he's probably in the newspapers like maybe he like um through his 20s maybe he was seen with a different girl like every couple of months and um like newspaper gossip or gossip about who who's dating and um, the man about town he's someone who's known like his name's probably been in the paper um He's almost like the equivalent of a celebrity, like for the Edwardian people, um, before kind of musicians and film stars were celebrities. It would have been the upper classes who would have been like the equivalent of celebrities then. Um, he's described as easy, well-bred. Um, so he's had a really, really good upbringing. He's like super confident. He He's really easy in his own skin. He can talk to anybody like with an ease and a confidence so really similar to mr burling but the difference is whereas mr burling is easy in himself gerald is well bred he's already a member of the upper classes and you can tell that by the way that he carries himself um mr burling um says i feel rather unfortunately you're just the sort of son-in-law i always wanted and when mr burling says that i almost think that he kind of tags on in law so it's like poor old eric always seems to be unfavorably compared to gerald so gerald is kind of everything that eric is not and you'll see as the play goes on mr burley makes further um uncomfortable comparisons between the two so it's almost like mr burley saying you're just the sort of son i always wanted um he's gerald is everything that he wishes eric was basically um and then Finally, um, the quotation I've got here is he produces a ring case. So he's got that kind of magic timing um, to impress Mrs. Burling. 
Um, and when he gives Sheila the ring, is it the one you wanted me to have? So she hasn't even chosen her own engagement ring. And um, I, I guess you could analyse this by saying that um, Gerald is a man who's used to making decisions and uh, he's definitely going to be the one who's in control of this relationship. So that's our Gerald. Okay, so um, what I've done, and again, you can find a copy of this in the description underneath. I've written you a model essay. Um, I'll read it through to you, but I'm not gonna go through the AO1, AO2 and AO3. So these assessment objectives are all from the AQA specification. And if you remember, it's 40% for AO1, 40% for AO2 and 20% for AO3. AO1 being the use of quotations and being able to use critical style and get your own opinions across really nicely. AO2 is all about analysing language, form and structure. So doing that analysis, but also using the technical terminology to help your analysis along. Whilst AO3 is all about the social and historical context so the relationships between text and the context in which they were written and this play as you've probably seen already has so much context tagged to it but do bear in mind it's only worth 20 percent of the mark we're not writing a history essay now what you've probably noticed um, that we didn't do for Macbeth is we've been collecting quotations and most of the quotations I've been trying to get you to collect have been short and that's because on this Inspector Calls essay for the AQA specification you don't get an extract so you're going to have to remember the quotations you want to write about in your exam um, and that's why lots of the quotations that I've tried to write down for you are only maybe three words long sometimes even one word and that's fine so anyway let's have a little look at this essay a J.B. Priestley presents Eric as a somewhat ambiguous character at the establishment phase of the play. He is half shy, half assertive, which suggests that he has strong opinions that he wants to convey, but is too nervous to make his voice heard. He is immediately contrasted with the older Gerald Croft, who has a confident, easy manner. Indeed, at the opening of the play, Eric tries to convey his ideas on several occasions, yet is shut down by his sister, who tells him not to be an ass, and his father, who effortlessly interrupts Eric, just let me finish, Eric, as if this is an everyday occurrence. On one occasion, though, Eric talks defiantly to Mr. Burling, introducing the audience to his more confident side. Like Sheila, Eric is in his early 20s, but Priestley certainly gives the impression that he is the younger sibling. Within the family unit, he enjoys very little respect. Priestley immediately establishes that Eric is separate from the rest of the Burling family by positioning him as the only character downstage. Perhaps Priestley presents Eric as isolated from the other characters to reveal that he doesn't fit in with the other family members' concerns and beliefs. Eric asks his father, what about war, revealing his fear for his own future? As a man in his early 20s, Eric would be one of the first to be conscripted into the army. The audience of 1945 and onwards know, of course, that in just two years, World War I will start and Eric will be required to fight, meaning he would need to lead his troops. As he still seems to be at his mother's beck and call, Eric, I want you a minute, and displays childish behaviour such as his guffaw at Gerald's behaviour, the audience will be shocked that this immature young man will soon have to take on such responsibility. However, as Eric is seated downstage, he is closest to the audience. A veteran of the Great War, Priestley invited many of his fellow soldiers from World War I to the London premiere of An Inspector Calls. By seating Eric closer to them, it creates a subliminal bond between members of the audience and this character, unlike the other characters who are separated from the audience by the dining table. 
Finally, Priestley establishes early on that Eric is a character who enjoys an alcoholic drink. Sheila describes him as squiffy, Edwardian slang for drunk. When Eric returns from a discussion with his mother, he takes the decanter and helps himself. This leads the audience to question why a young man from a privileged background drinks enough to be noticeably drunk at a family gathering. Maybe he needs alcohol to give him the confidence to overcome his shyness. The audience would feel sympathy that a young man should be so anxious in his own home, a place where he should feel safe. Perhaps, though, Eric has other worries on his mind. When the more experienced Gerald and Mr. Burling discuss women, Eric attempts to join their conversation, eagerly stating, yes, I remember. But as he begins to talk, he checks himself. An astute audience member might wonder what it was Eric was so eager to share one minute, but then holds back a moment later, and what it is that stops him joining this man talk. So um, for your challenge task, see if you can have a go at writing an essay, which is similar for Sheila, probably be a little bit shorter because you don't have all that historical context for Sheila. Um, but it might be interesting to look for clues in the players to some of those cracks in the relationship between Sheila and Gerald. And also think, like Eric, how Sheila seems to have those two sides to her personality, the very serious and almost aggressive side, but the very silly, playful and immature side to her. So your title might for that one might be something like, how does J.B. Priestley present Sheila in the opening of an inspector calls? Now, um, I always say to my students, if you get to a situation where you know that you haven't revised an inspector calls properly, and you've got the exam tomorrow, then you can't go too far wrong by just revising basically what I've done in this lesson and the previous lesson about the stage directions, because you have got almost everything that you need to know about the five main characters, everyone except the inspector. Um, there's so much social and historical context in the opening of the play. This essay that I've written on Eric here, just based on the first 10 minutes of the play, is about 400 words. And if you wrote 400 words onto A4 paper in medium sized handwriting, it would still be a five or six page essay. So it's a really, really decent length and yet hopefully you can see by my highlighting how that essay absolutely hits every one of those assessment objectives enough to get you into a high band and to get you a good mark on this essay. What I've done here is I've done a lot with a little. So if you happen to come to this video or come back to this video and your exam is coming up really really soon then maybe focus on the first 10 minutes the first 10 pages of this play and know them absolutely back to front rather than panicking and trying to learn the whole 64 page worth or whatever it is um like when you've only got an hour or two to go so as i said not annotated but a copy of that essay is in the description underneath so you can um, download and annotate it by using these two pages um, have a go if you want to uh, writing this essay you can submit that to me by email or on microsoft teams um, and good luck um, i'll see you soon Bye-bye.